All right. Well, let's get to WrestleMania night two. Let's do it. Because WrestleMania night one ended, like we said, on a up note. Everyone went home happy. I was so optimistic about things coming into night two. Really enjoyed night one. And night two got off to a really good start, I think. All right. By the way, who is Jimmy Allen? He is, I believe, a country musician. Okay, what credentials does he have to open up WrestleMania? It's again well, means you don't opened up WrestleMania. Anyone could no, sing the open. Look of here, you know one of the first stories that Bruce Pritchard told me, and this is actually a true one, believe it or not. When I got to the WWF, was we were talking about WrestleMania and the celebrities that you know Vince always got, and did and Bruce said, "Did you hear about Joe Walsh?" I said, "What are you talking about?" He said. We had a chance one time to get Joe Walsh to play the national anthem or do the national anthem. And I said, well, why didn't he? He said, Vince didn't know who he was. I said, what? Joe Walsh, the Eagles. Vince didn't, and Vince didn't know who he was. Now, instead of Vince not knowing who the artist is, the fans don't know who the artist is. Well, country fans know who he is. You don't know who he is. You don't know any modern country For stars, do sake. you? Well, no, and and not personally, by name. But it it depends on on modern now. Well, there's that there's that one girl. Which one? There's a and, few and of them. And the she's blonde. Which one? Um, and she was on a TV show. But hey, but right. here's the thing: the grand old going, Opry over here, ladies and they're gentlemen. They're going from country to Snoop Dogg. To, they're all over the page. They pick a WWE. genre and stick with it. How many how many fucking country fans were there? Then would would they have rioted if Snoop Dogg was out there? It's WWE. They will latch on to any musician or celebrity oh, that yes. shows any interest. We found we found out at the Great American Bashes in the eighties that people didn't necessarily give a shit about mixing their music with their wrestling, regardless of the genre. But I will, I will move on. WWE does it right. They don't tell anyone they're going to be there. Dusty told everyone, hey, yeah. Delbert McClinton <laughs> after the main event. What? And there was a, it looked like a Who concert in reverse trying to get out of the stadium <laughs> before Delbert came in. Anyway, so Miz and Snoop Dogg did the intro. And I'm still not happy that Miz was there, but by the end of the show, I was happy that Snoop Dogg was there. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So Brock Lesnar faced almost in the first match. And one would have to think that the order of matches here in this case was determined not only by Brock saying, I got to go on first because the Jets motor is running, but also, again, let's have the fans' expectations as low as possible. <laughs> they haven't seen anything yet. Let it, The first bump will be memorable because... It didn't suck, and we were afeared it was going to. But, I, you know, it was this almost, it, they had to keep it so short and so simple and so glacial-paced and that it was kind of like a bait-and-switch because they built up this goddamn confrontation that afterwards it was like, is that what that was? Is that it? Was it a letdown? Even you and I, as experts, expected it to suck, which it would have if it had gone even a minute or two longer. But the average fan, and they were all happy to be there. Uh, but do you think even they were like, eh, to start off like that? It was what it was. No, it, I, I can't say it was a two minute match because they drug it out, but it was almost no selling everything brock selling great a bear hug a couple body slams and then brock germined him three times and f5'd him one two three it was great i thought it was great <laughs> i loved it it was exactly how long it should be it was exactly how much action it never slowed down never slowed down it never speeded up it was exactly what it needed to be Everyone but did, reacted. But everyone yes. reacted. You've never seen Brock get thrown around and get his ass kicked like that. I loved it. I will agree with you that it was exactly what it needed to be. My question is, did it need to be at all? 
Should they have booked Brock Should versus they Omos? Have booked this at all for WrestleMania? Maybe not, but I'm going to argue about what I reviewed, what I watched. I liked it. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Started things off on a positive note for me. All right. All right. It it didn't suck, and it very easily could have if they'd have done anything different. I agree with that. But it was like, well, you know, we see, here's the thing. And Bobby Lashley comes out later on carrying the Andre the Giant Battle Royal Trophy. And that's all we saw of him on this show because they fell into the trap of involving that fucking moron Bray Wyatt and his kabuki ish bullshit. And it screwed up the positioning of two of their major stars on the biggest show of the year, because after one guy didn't want to just absolutely didn't want to work with him and rightfully so. And then the other guy, he fucking disappears on and goes into the fucking vapor. Then nobody still knows what his fucking issue is. So anyway, but that was the, the opening match. And yes, uh, again, <sighs> It was interesting to see Brock get manhandled and be the underdog, but I would I would like, and if he's done and, you know, he went out on a high note, he still won. Maybe he's not done now that the Vince is still involved. Remember, he walked out when they ran Vince off. Now that Vince is back and a big sale to a, his former company, he's been the champion of both of their divisions now. So... Maybe he's coming back. In that case, you know, he'll 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 move past this. But it was just, eh. you would hope that Brock could show vulnerability like that with somebody that was actually going to draw money in the future. That's what I'm saying to you. What's draw money in the future, though? On a pay-per-view? So yes, uh, well, a pay-per-view or whatever they're gonna be, however they're gonna be operating this fucking thing the you know going forward but in some almost is you know the ceiling is there right so why not do this now that's the thing it's one thing if they had booked this when almost first showed up years ago as whatever was he in the fight pit with shane and dabo kato i don't even remember but then he's with aj he's like his bodyguard then he just starts wrestling now he's with mvp if at the very beginning this giant who looks ultra impressive and could do this kind of thing with Brock, if you'd done something like this then, it'd be one thing, but because you haven't, how much longer do you think you keep it almost? Well, you shouldn't say that. They kept Kali around for years. Yeah. They like having giants. Yes. You can't see the giants for the trees. Anyway, speaking of not being able to see things, um, the next match was the four women's team showcase or whatever Raquel and Liv Shotzi and Natalia Rhonda and Shayna and Cruella and Chelsea and you know I just I turned my head for a second and got distracted and I don't know what happened here what did I miss I saw this match was coming on the screen and I also saw that I had the Jim Cornette experience to work on <laughs> so I decided this will be one of the matches that I don't feel like I'm going to miss anything and I can't imagine anyone could argue that I would. Okay. So moving forward, the Intercontinental title was on the line. Our boy Gunther against Drew and Seamus. Seamus. Seamus or Seamus? Yeah, you I'll can't just, even get it straight anymore. Seamus. I'm just tired. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm so tired. Tired of watching the wrestling. <laughs> but I'll give him Seamus for this one. They beat the shit out of each other. Oh boy. Um, it, it, for some reason, by the way, Titus O'Neil was on color and he spent the first five minutes of the match. Every time somebody throw a chop, he's call the police. But I guess, you know, this is not the role for him, not the role for him. No. Uh, I love, I love Gunther and I liked this match and I like all three of these guys in their own way, in their own fashion. And again, it, it was a three-way. And the thing that bothers me throughout, even though they did a lot of good stuff that we will we will comment on, is there's invariably the long stretch where the one of the three motherfuckers just disappears. Just you even on the wide shot, do they roll under the ring? 
Is there a trap door? And then they come back at the right time, but over and over again. And it's the same thing in every match. And it's distracting, you know, to me when, when you can't even find the other guy and he's gone like he's been ab abducted rather than just sidelined with a super kick or whatever. But that's what you got to put up with with the three ways. Um, it makes it easier to put up with that, and I agree with you, when the crowd is losing their shit at what's going yeah. on. That helps. Because these guys, were they, they, they all three have the same kind of smash mouth and lay it in style and everything, and it was a big fucking fight. And uh, Sheamus got a standing ovation for 30 of the broad arms. And, uh, you know, they did some good false finishes and the people were losing their shit. And then again, finally, it came down to Drew and Sheamus not being able to coexist with each other. And they wore each other out. And then Gunther came back in right as they were about to fucking finish it. Gunther came back in with a splash off the top and a power bomb on Sheamus on Drew and then a power bomb on Drew. Boom, one, two, three. So thank God the right result. You can't critique it like a match because you can't keep track of what go. It's just they they trade off doing spots with you know each other in in turn, and then the third guy will come in and break something up, and then they'll tag back out or whatever. So you can't really follow it as a match, but they beat the shit out of each other, and people liked it. And Rick Rubin was in the front row. Looking his age. Looking, uh, which is apparently, again, what's the matter with me, Brian? Everybody I've ever known that's either the same age as me or potentially even younger looks like shit. And I remain on the steady curve that I've been. I started out looking kind of like shit and I've not deviated. But everybody else started out looking good and they've submerged into total shit it's like the worst episode of the twilight zone i've ever seen this match was great and i wasn't looking forward to it because i like gunther i'm not a big fan of three-way matches and i've been bored with sheamus and drew but at some point with them all kicking the shit out of each other they got yeah. me into it and the crowd the crowd getting so into it got me further into it so you could uh, ignore things like people disappearing but man when you see all these other matches everywhere where there's just a spot in the middle of the match or at the end of the match where they stop and they just start trading stuff. And we always say, yeah, those forearms look like shit or the punches look like shit. Everything they did here looked amazing and looked like yeah. it hurt and it probably did. And it kept going and going. Like you said, it's hard to critique it like a regular match because of various things, but... It was a fight and it, a struggle and the... Even if one thing didn't logically follow the other, the emotion and the passion they had and the way that they were swinging and not just hitting each other hard and or recklessly, but, you know, hard in safe places, laying stuff in and working and body language follow through. That's what fires fucking people up. In-ring brawl. That's yeah. what it was. It was an in-ring brawl. Like what you would see in Mid-South Wrestling, maybe not to this level, but just... <laughs> stiff and you can't look at that and go "Ooh, i want to do that it's impossible yeah. <laughs> good that good analogy or good comment whichever and that's it there needs to be more wrestling going on where you can look at it and say wow i like watching this but no i don't want to do that because we've uh, enticed too many people who's oh i can do that anybody can do that shit but yes so but anyway and gunther retains the intercontinental title and uh, remember i said was it yesterday when we did the last show why can't, or maybe it was the two days ago when we did the one before why can't they start a reign for gunther like they've had for roman reigns and because he's already had the intercontinental title for longer than most people because they bounced it around like a fucking ping pong ball so really start doing something with him being a dominant champion Corey. that's for we knew what else was going on, but nevertheless. I think he's going to get the record. I think he's going to beat the Honky Tonk Man's record. <laughs> that's the last. I, I'm serious. I think that's something that was going to happen. You know, I was just thinking it would be not only the funniest thing that ever happened, but also 
The, and I'm not actually advocating for this. See, this is one of the ideas that guys used to have in the car. The wrestlers, when we'd be driving back from the show, we'd have an idea for booking and we'd pop ourselves, but we would never dream. I would say the best thing was when Gunther has a big ceremony on Raw or wherever the fuck for breaking the Honky Tonk Man's record, that there would they'd play the music and there would come Wayne and challenge him. But see, then just to see, actually, it would be entertaining for the boys to see Wayne's reaction with the one and only time that Gunther would chop him. And then he would fucking see you motherfucker and leave. Anyway. See, if that was on an indie show, he would have found a way to sing his theme song three times and not do anything. <laughs> All right. The following match was for the another one of the women's titles there in, in the company, Bianca Belair against Oscar. And Brian, I want you to know that I realized that you would just harangue me and chastise me and blister me and verbally eviscerate me if I didn't watch this match since I already skipped the other girls, right? So I watched this match, and and you are a bigger fan of Bianca Belair than I am, and you have many good things to say about Oscar. So tell me what you thought of this match first. It took me a while to get into it, but by the end, I was really into it, and I think Bianca Belair is incredibly impressive. Okay. Good match, though. I like the match. Well, see, I'm not well-versed in most of their matches, but I watched this one. After I had watched the previous night, Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley, and everybody can look up what we uh, on the YouTube channel or listen to the podcast, what we thought of that match, but it was the possibly best, what'd you say, best women's match in the United States ever? North America. North America. Um, uh, my favorite match of the night of WrestleMania 1. <sighs> This was, and I know, and I'm not saying that Bianca and good old Oscar are the shits. And I'm not saying that they're not, and, and it they blow away what we see in indie women's wrestling or in the AEW women's division. Um, and, you know, my problem with Asuka is not only the fact that they've presented her with such a ludicrous gimmick, and I'm not talking about a kabuki outfit or face paint, but I'm talking about the screaming and the constipated yelling and everything, but also that she's barely as tall as the top rope, which is five feet off the fucking ground, if that. Um, But watching this after watching Charlotte and Rhea, it, this was a modern match. Not even a modern girls match, just a modern match. They started out 100 miles an hour. They did a lot fast. It got sloppy in spots. At, at one point, Bianca Belair powerbombed after they're out on the floor jockeying for position, powerbombed Asuka on the floor, rolled her in the ring and got a two count. And the very next move was Asuka ducking a charge into the corner, a schoolboy, and then she's fine. And it was back and forth. They did a ton of moves. But it with Charlotte and Rhea, there was there was a baby face and heel dynamic. And also there was the dynamic of the heel becoming the baby face and the baby face incumbent champion becoming technically the heel because the crowd wanted to see a title change. Here they were popping on moves because it's two baby faces and Bianca's gonna skip around and Asuka's going to be pleasing. Um, it, it, there wasn't a lot of logic to the match. It was a modern style match. They did a lot, but nothing really stayed with you. If And finally, Bianca ducks the mist that why did the baby face want to blind the, the champion with mist? We don't know. Uh, just to win the belt? Well, then why is she a baby face? Well, maybe she's not going to be like, I don't care. Oscar got an arm bar. Bianca rolled through and hit her finish one, two, three. The fans loved it. They love modern matches. But after, again, Charlotte and Rhea was not only the best match on night one of WrestleMania as far as a pro wrestling match, you could have taken that and you could have put it anywhere. You could have put it 
on a WCW pay-per-view in the 90s or a WWF pay-per-view in the 90s, the Attitude Era. And it, it, it would have torn the house down just like it did, you know, on a Saturday night. You could have put that match in the Superdome in 1985 and Bill Watts would have probably enjoyed it. You could have put that match in St. Petersburg at the Bayfront Center in 1977 and I bet Eddie Graham would have told some of his guys, hey, take some fucking notes. They were working and it was wrestling. This was modern move performance, you know, and, and I don't blame Bianca because she's brand new. She didn't grow up in the wrestling business or apparently like Rhea study it from what I assume was a young age or just have an amazing aptitude for physical movement and know what the fuck to do. And Asuka's from Japan and they got a whole different way of doing things over there these days. But this is not the girl wrestling that I, you know, give a shit about, whereas I would watch the other ones all day long because it was wrestling. It wasn't just girls wrestling. Yeah, but you're comparing anything to the, maybe the greatest female match of all time. Well, yeah, but I'm talking, I'm talking about visually, I'm talking about the, their, their styles. I'm talking about the psychologically, the things they did. It, it could have been a guy's match. The future's Bianca versus Rhea. <sighs> I'd, and that's the problem. I'm I mean, hoping it, that Rhea can bring out the, the best in Bianca or whatever the case, because again, the, um, the legitimate emotion, Bianca, if a fucking heel was to come along and slice her mother in half with a chainsaw would still come out for the match, skipping and twirling her hair. Cause she's, she's been taught to perform. Charlotte has some innate knowledge of what wrestling is based on her family lines. And Rhea is apparently just a fucking savant. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Well, the next match, well, there was more Miz and Snoopy, and the weekend attendance was 161,892. What do you think the real weekend attendance was? Did they say they had like 65,000 tickets out for each night a day or two beforehand? Something like that. Probably like 135,000 or something. But this, <laughs> this counts everybody that was working in the stadium, all the parking attendants, anybody that was around, EMT crew, fucking homeless bums. It is California sleeping in the street outside in the parking lot. Spirits who died during the construction of the building. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Hoffa <laughs> is buried underneath that. They counted him too. So... Miz was upset at Snoop because he put him in a match the previous night and Snoop said, you want to do it again? And I guess Miz wasn't done complaining because he's like, well, you ruined my suit. I don't come to your studio and show you how to rap. And I'm thinking, boy, if they brought out LA Knight right now and he just beat the shit out of the Miz, how big you think that pop would have been? I was waiting to figure out who it would be. That was my first guess, just because of what's been happening. Why not capture that moment? Have that here. L.A. Night in L.A. That's at right. WrestleMania beating up The Miz, the movie star. Instead, this turned into one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life. I was losing it watching this. I, You know, I couldn't, I couldn't laugh because I've told you before, Shane's my favorite one. I like him. He's he's got his picadillos, but he's a a good he was a good kid. He's a nice guy at heart, right? And he it just I guarantee you that he probably called Vince and said, "Dad, can I do Mania one more time? I've been working out. I'm in shape." And I guarantee you that's and and I want to redeem myself cuz what was it the Royal Rumble last year? He didn't make a good impression. And so they uh, uh, were going to have folks, if you didn't see this, they were going to have Shane come down and have an impromptu match with The Miz and do what I assume Shane was going over. So Snoop, <laughs> you're not doing it any justice. 
This was such an all-time hysterically well, hold on. awful I'm, I'm segment. Gonna, I'm just saying what they were gonna do. His music hits. You hear that? Here comes the money thing, and then here comes old Shane McMahon yes. bopping all around the stage doing his thing. You already knew that something was gonna go wrong. <laughs> well, because he was huge. He looked. Did you see how puffy he was? He was jacked up like a, a jacked up Dana White with hair. His face was round and he's 50 he's almost 55 now right because i'm over 60 he's about seven or eight years younger than me anyway shane mcmahon is 53 years old okay so he's fucking he's huge he's wearing the tight shirt showing the big arms and he's dancing and doing the ollie shuffling the whole nine yards and when he gets in the ring he gets the microphone and as he's, he's didn't really do a promo just to say, uh, to say to the fans, Hey, I love you guys. Thank you for that response. You know, sends his love. He was blowed up already because he'd been so hyper. And then uh, Snoop here, he didn't exactly set this up in a stellar fashion. He's just like, it was, they played the music. Shane comes out. He said, let's get a referee. And no, nah, you in there. I'm out here or whatever. And the bell rings. And Shane immediately starts with the rabbit jabs. Boom, boom, boom. And Miz is back in the corner. And then Shane backs Miz up and shoots him off and drops down. And here's... Before I tell the people what happened, Brian, in any wrestling school, one of the most elementary fucking things that you would ever learn is you don't shoot a guy off and either let him come off the ropes and give you a move or you, and you don't shoot a guy off by the arm and drop down. If you drop down, you need to shoot a guy off out of a headlock because then you're committing an offensive move in defense, right? He's in control. You're throwing him off of you. When you're in control of the guy's arm, you're, you're throwing him into the ropes and then dropping down to, avoid a move that he shouldn't be able to give you. Have I made that somewhat clear? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So Shane arm whips Miz off and drops down because he's got to get some space so he can do his leapfrog because Shane is, I guess, decided one of the things he wants to do to show his athleticism is his big high leapfrog. <laughs> when, he, when he was like in the air and a leapfrog, you think he's thinking, wait until Endeavor sees this. They're going to need me around. That, you know what? <laughs> when he hit the height, that was a high leapfrog and he spread those legs out and goddamn, you could just hear the front row and it would have spread starting the you've still got it chant. They went, you've <laughs> still, and then he landed. And then he buckled. And he went down to the left and spun around over on his fucking hands and knees. And now Miz is coming off the ropes. And he, after he's been <laughs> leapfrogged, he's coming off the ropes and he sees Shane. <laughs> Shane is down. Shane is down, as Rene Goulet might say. So he runs past Shane thinking Shane has stumbled. And Shane will stand up. If I just run past him and come off the other side, Shane will be back up on his feet by the time I come back to him. And so Miz runs past Shane, who's on his hands and knees, starting to get up. And as Shane gets up and puts weight on his leg, he realizes that he can't get up and he crumples face first to the mat. And Miz comes off the other side of the ropes. And it's like this time Shane tried to fucking... <laughs> Drop down for real and trip Miz's feet out from under him. And Miz just had to stop and stand there and stare at him. <laughs> and then Shane is groveling on the ground. He's turned over on his back and he's, he's yelled something. Probably, <laughs> I'm fucked. And then Miz backs up in the corner and just has this blank look. And... Then the, the the referee goes check on Shane, who obviously cannot get to his feet. And I love that this is a new McMahon thing. The, the surprise appearance and then blowing out your quads. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you you've told the people he didn't blow. I thought he blew his knee when, a, but uh, apparently the news after the match was 
he he tore his quad the same thing that Vince did and that's the only thing that's <laughs> funny at all about it poor Shane I was so embarrassed for him but the doctor comes in and is checking on him and here comes of all people now you see the referee the the female referee she uh, puts her hand to her ear she's trying to hear her earpiece I'm pretty sure they're probably telling her something, but I didn't see her have time to talk to Snoop. <laughs> Saying I didn't see Miz. Miz just stood there with a blank look on his face. Snoop Dogg comes back in and said, no, it can't be like that, and fucking punches Miz. <laughs> and down goes Miz. And then I think that the referee may have told him, yeah, do it again, or Miz called it or something, because Miz gets back up and he nails Miz again. And then... Snoop Dogg, as they've they've slid Shane out, you never saw him again. Snoop Dogg gives Miz the stiffest people's elbow. He actually did jump up in the air and drop elbow first on this man's sternum. Uh, it looked like shit until it got there, and then it hurt, and covered him one, two, three. So Snoop Dogg pins Miz at WrestleMania. I watched the press conference afterwards and Triple H put him over big time. He said a lot of wrestlers in that position would have frozen, not known what to do. Yeah, like Miz. This guy, we always knew he was a fan. He's done other things. He showed us that he actually has instincts here <laughs> to go in there and he saved the segment. And if this is the last appearance of Shane McMahon. Ever, that's the, that's the sad thing. I feel so bad for Shane and his his kids are so nice and... He's just can you, so embarrassing. Can you imagine? The last time he's there is that Royal Rumble where he didn't look that great in a match and it appeared something was off and then we found out something was off and they told him never come back ever again. And then he shows up here and just seconds into it. Seconds. He's <laughs> and he's, uh, and I'm and laughing too much. I'm sorry I find it so funny. It's so funny. And he's, he's, gonna, he's <laughs> fucked his life up for the next six months. Because that will be surgery and recovery and rehab. And, and, and if it worked for Tony Khan, the company would pay for it. <laughs> yeah, I, w I wonder if he's going to turn this one into the WWF for the new company. What's his WrestleMania payoff going to be? Oh, my God. Um, Have I told you the Glenn Kulka story? No. You what's remember the, that, right? I remember Glenn Kulka, but what's, what story? Glenn Kulka was a big muscle builder, tough looking guy that had played. He was from Canada and he had played for the Canadian football league. And he was a big time amateur athlete. And he was an early developmental guy. He, before I came down to, uh, uh, OVW, when they were sending guys down to Memphis to Randy Hale's power pro wrestling, Glenn was, Part of that, he was very early developmental program, like first, uh, you know, first half a dozen or so guys. Yeah, that's where I remember him from, Memphis. Yeah. And he was a badass looking guy and he was a nice guy and kind of got the, the picture and everything, but he had just started training. And so Dr. Tom Pritchard had worked with him and he's one at Dory Funk Jr. had worked with him and he'd been in Memphis and everything and. They goddamn, I can't remember the particulars, but somehow or another, there was a big independent show in his hometown that they had booked and they booked him on so he could go and he could appear. It was either his hometown or his home, the college he graduated from or whatever, but it was, it was a big crowd in this gym and they're all there to see Glenn Kulka. And he comes out and makes the big entrance and gets in the ring and jumps up on the second rope and does the thing where, yay! And, you know, he's got his arms up and the crowd is exulting him and he's so fired up and he's so happy, this infectious crowd behind him. He jumps off the second turnbuckle and turns and jumps back into the middle of the ring and lands and breaks his fucking leg. Oh, man! Boom! Oh, no. Goes down he goes! <laughs> and... And they carried him out. 
That's the thing. Whoever Shane said goodbye to in the back before he went out, like seconds later, he was being carted right past them. <laughs> and that, well, while we're on the subject of embarrassing debuts, remember Mike Furness's hot tag in Knoxville? That was for you. Yes. Doug Furness, uh, the world's strongest man, an incredible Japanese star. He he went to the University of Tennessee, was a football star, was legitimately uh, one of the strongest men in the world. Power. Everybody knows who Doug Furness is, right? And he's the one that ripped the door off the cage in Knoxville. It led to me stealing it for Kane to rip the door off the hell and sell. And... He called me when I was running Smoky Mountain and said, my brother Mike, who also played football at the University of Tennessee, was a good amateur athlete. My brother Mike, he wants to learn how to wrestle. If you guys will train him and break him in, I'll come out. Because by then, Doug was living in California. He went to Japan so much for Baba, like every six weeks. But he, he would come out and work like the big Christmas show and some of my big events in Knoxville, right? Oh, okay, great a local hero. So we, we trained Mike as best we can. Horner worked with him. And I think Tom and, and Jimmy Del Rey, because we were going to make the match, the Furnace brothers against the heavenly bodies, Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey. So he worked with Mike and Mike made some TV appearances and he was not, he was not either a natural in the, in the ring or a natural promo. You could tell it wasn't uh, the, he wasn't his brother, Doug, unfortunately. Not to say he wasn't a nice fella. But, you know, Doug's going to be in, right? So we shoot the angle where we beat up Mike Furness. He calls his brother Doug. Christmas night in Knoxville. The big event, our biggest crowd, one of our big crowds of the year, that and the big August show. And it's going to be the Furness brothers against Heavenly Bodies. Well, because Mike was going to continue on with us, you know, and continue wrestling, whereas Doug would only make an appearance here and there. And also because Doug was more experienced, Doug said, I'll sell, get the heat on me, and then let's give Mike the tag. He can make the comeback, and then we'll do, you know, the finish. And that way I can get it right for Mike, and he'll look like a bit, okay, perfect, right? So Doug Furness, it, the heavenly body's getting him in a ring, and he's selling his ass off, and they're kicking the shit out of him, and I'm drawing the referee and they're double teaming him and the people are getting hot. We're trying to build for this big hot tag. And finally the heavenly bodies go for their, I think it was, if I can't, if I remember right, Tom is holding Doug and Jimmy comes off the top with his big moonsault body block and Doug moves and Tom flatten their Jimmy flattens Tom and they're both down and Doug struggles to the corner and dive and makes the tag and Tom's coming up, and as Mike steps through the ropes, he runs as fast and as hard as he can, three steps, and leaps up in the air and hits Tom Pritchard with a flying clothesline, and Tom takes a big bump, and Mike spins around in the air and lands on the mat and continues rolling and rolls <laughs> all the way out of the ring <laughs> on the other side and drops to the floor. <laughs> Just couldn't stop himself and went right under the bottom rope and disappeared. And Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Del Rey is coming up to take the second clothesline and turns around and Tom's laying there flat on his back and there's nobody else in the fucking ring. <laughs> You see a hand come up on the other side of the apron <laughs> and grab the bottom rope. And he's pulled, he, he pulled himself in and slid right back in and ran as fast as he could at Jimmy and leveled him <laughs> for the clothesline. And a goddamn, I'm nervous. He went from the apron of one side of the ring, through the ropes, into the ring, through the air, down and under the bottom rope on the other side <laughs> of the ring in like two and a half seconds. Oh, God damn it. Do uh, you think it'll be uh, SummerSlam or the Royal Rumble when Stephanie comes back to wave to the fans and blow out her quad? <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is, Ed, maybe at, at Halloween they can have a special three-legged race with Shane and Vince 
tied together. All Man, right. You know what's funny? Did Vince even blow out his quads last year? What, what happened when Vince couldn't take the stunner? He didn't blow out his quads, did he? No, he just crumpled like a goddamn fucking <laughs> used slinky. And that's the same way like Shane's legs just... went. He looked exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Every year there's going to be a segment where the McMahons come out there and just flop around the ring. <laughs> and, and here he is, ladies and gentlemen. He walks, he talks, he crawls on his belly like a reptile. <laughs> Shane McMahon. Oh, I, was, I, I feel so bad. No, with, with, with the stunner, Vince just, I think... Well, I don't know. You want to talk feeling bad? It was Shane. Shane, famous last words. Hey, Dad, we should buy UFC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now let's see where they got home. Now Vince <laughs> says to Shane, "Well, Shane, goddamn it, pal, you blew your quad out WrestleMania thirty seconds in, and he can say, well, you motherfucker, at the Royal Rumble, you blew both your quads <laughs> just sliding into the ring.'" And then, then he can say, besides, I told you to buy that UFC. Now That's look right. where we are. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, see, I told you WrestleMania was fun. God damn it. But if <laughs> so, anyway, who else fell out of the ring? I can think of it. <laughs> see, the problem is Shane's going to go. I can't let that be the last time I'm seen on the grandest stage of them all. And what's the other option? It's either I come out there, I do the simple stuff, or I dive off a giant structure. Hey, so I'm worried no, about what, what next time it'll be. You know what? Here is a very interesting thing. Is the new $21 billion company to be <laughs> named whatever that's not completely and totally operated by the WWE, are they going to allow a 53-year-old father of two who hasn't wrestled in several years come out and do something like that. Or even a 56-year-old Stone Cold Steve Austin or a however-year-old whoever the guy. Well, it's funny. On CNBC earlier, Scott Wapner asked uh, Ari Emanuel and Vince McMahon, he said, what if Mr. McMahon, the character, wants to come out and do something in the ring? Is that okay? And before Ari Emanuel answered, Vince was like, ah, oh, he's dead. The character's dead. <laughs> but Ari Emanuel said, yes, whatever he wants to do, he's allowed to do. So well, I think they're going to still operate under Vince's rules. No, but think about this. Well, they, they I, might I agree have, the liability is much bigger. They might have until, until their legal department. Hey, all that, Sinclair Broadcasting, they were a billion-dollar company, at least on paper, when they bought Ring of Honor. Point me to your legal department. <laughs> and listen, listen here, we were in Charleston, West Virginia. The goddamn, I get a phone call from the legal department saying that the guys can't take part in a chicken wing eating contest at Hooters that night that was our sponsor. Or the fans couldn't, the guys could, but the fans couldn't, or something. I said, what are you talking? Well, there's a liability. I said, wait a minute. So if one of these motherfuckers chokes on a fucking chicken bone at Hooters because we said, hey, get in a contest to see if you can eat more chicken wings than Jay Briscoe, they're going to be able to sue us? Oh, it could. I, God, I threw my cell phone all the way across the building. So what I'm saying to you is now that live in front of 60 to 80,000 people, depending on the report, and God and everybody on pay-per-view and streaming television, Shane McMahon seriously injured himself and is going to require surgery. He's 53 years old doing a leapfrog. Are they going to, are they going to have a, another situation where, okay, if you're past such and such age, you can't participate or you've got to pass a physical for any kind of, interaction because they don't understand what can be worked and what can't be. I mean, Steve Austin could come out. He's not going to try to do a fucking leapfrog. He's got a bad knee, but he can still be Steve Austin as we saw in doing Steve Austin things. But will they be able to differentiate that between the people that can get by with it and do what they need to do and won't hurt themselves and the people that obviously or apparently can't. And how do you do who's going to be determining that the legal department? liability multi-billions of dollars it's not like 
you know, well, dad said I could anymore. Anyway, and speaking of liability, the next match, but answer me that there, Brian Last, what do you think? Until we're shown otherwise, I'm going to go under the assumption they're going to keep doing things the way they do it. They are better about these things than AEW. I think we will see at WrestleMania 40, Shane versus Dante Martin. <laughs> the big match. But, you know, I mean, I don't, Shane shouldn't be out I there think, to begin with. I think with. Shane's got a better chance of being on WrestleMania 40 than Dante Martin, but go ahead. But, I mean, Shane shouldn't be out there to begin with. There's a difference between a Steve Austin being billed to be there and used in a limited capacity to take advantage of his star power versus a 50-something who shouldn't be doing... I mean, it's one thing if Shane went out there and just delivered the bad punches, okay? And then you set him up for Snoop to do something. But as soon as he went to do something physical that he can't do, it just made the whole thing look bad. Well, and I'm not arguing with you about that. I'm, I'm saying that I think that somebody in the legal department wouldn't know the difference in how that could be handled. Whose legal department? Does WWE maintain their own legal department or is it part of Endeavor's... Uh... See, that's the thing. How many jobs in corporate are going to be eliminated because of redundancy? And also duplication. What was the next match? Well, I'll tell you what the next match was, Brian. It was hell in a cell. And boy, it was hell. They, they were snake bit this night. I, 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 when have you seen two inadvertent injuries come within, what, 20 minutes of each other? Not even? In WWE, not often. Yeah, depending on how long the fucking entrances took. It was Edge and Finn Balor, and they did the big entrances, and Finn came out as the demon. And boy, the, you know, they go overboard, now they got a budget on these entrances. Now, very theatrical, blah, blah, blah. But it's a Hell in a Cell match. So they, they start out trading a couple of punches, and then they both just jump out of the ring not connected to each other, not fighting. They jump out of the ring and both go under the ring and start pulling out weapons in the first minute. They got a hat on a hat. And whether it's kendo sticks or a chair. And then uh, apparently now the demon was before we started reviewing for the most part. I remember seeing clips, a little bit of him. But now when he paints his face, he doesn't sell chair shots. Is that the... Uh, is that the, the M.O. here? He's invulnerable because of his face paint. You know, I haven't seen the face paint thing in a while, but when he first came out on the entranceway and they're making a big deal out of him being the demon, you know, I wanted to really pay attention to it. And again, I lost it. I'm coming out of the Shane McMahon segment, which made me cry with laughter. And it appears one of the things the demon does is just stick his tongue out. <laughs> so, like, he's on the entrance trying to be like this evil demon. He's just sticking his tongue out. It looks ridiculous. Not like in an evil, I'm a demon way, but like, I'm a little kid and I'm mad at you way. If he's the demon, he <sighs> is impervious to pain, except when he starts feeling pain. Except when he feels pain. Yes. So half the match at the start was guys going out to get other gimmicks out from under the ring, and Edge did a deal where he put Balor in the corner of the cage and wedged him in with kendo sticks through the... through the link of the the chain link of the fence so like and then he would go and get more gimmicks like that a guy couldn't just take and goddamn remove those help me brian was he he was not immobilized in a way that you could like if this was an a western and and you were robbing the bank he wasn't tied up like the school marm to where she couldn't get out and warn the sheriff he was just standing there in the corner of the cage with two kendo sticks in front of him to keep him in. And he responded like any of us would, by sticking at his tongue and <laughs> making <Yes>. faces. <laughs> so then Edge pulled out a table and le leaned it up in the corner. And now, the, you know, I said they hadn't been in the ring since first 30 seconds at this point. Now they got back in the ring and got right back out. And Finn drop kicked Edge through the table and pulled out another chair and another chair and another chair and was throwing him and hitting Edge in the head with him. And I was losing my patience. And then they got in the ring, Edge did two moves, got a two count, and they went back to the floor and pulled out a ladder. 
And then Edge came in and threw the ladder at Finn Balor and hit him in the head. And he sold that one and went down and immediately there was a pool of blood forming. And then the referee starts holding Edge off and the camera gets a close-up of Edge and the people start booing because the referee is holding Edge from attacking his opponent in a Hell in a Cell match with no DQ and a blah, blah, blah. And I saw a bunch of people on Twitter, what? how dare they stop it? Uh, they didn't stop the whole match, folks. Don't panic now. But how dare they halt the match for blood? It's Hell in a Cell. Well, if you saw the picture of Finn Balor's head <laughs> afterwards, it was a giant fucking gash. Well, he threw the ladder right at his head. The way yes. it hit him, like, perfect. And he got his hands up, fortunately. They just went through the fucking ladder and the rung of it hit him in the head. Um, but so now what they do is they won't show any of Finn on camera whatsoever. So they've got a close up of edge and it's, and the announcers are calling it, but it's off putting because it's just a close up of edge staring there and you can't see what's going on. Then edge goes out and pulls out more weapons because he knows the camera's on him. And at least he's giving people something to look at and they'll pop for it. And they popped for it, but this is the thing. Apparently, from what I'm told from people in the building, they gave Balor a quick shot, a numbing shot, and stapled his head up so he could continue. Because yeah. it's WrestleMania. That's what I heard. However, and I'm fully in favor of that, you know, that that they should treat because that was a bad cut, right? However, could they not? This is what I would have said if I was at the gorilla position to the announcers and the ring announcer. I would have told the ring announcer, go to the referee and say what I tell you to say. Ladies and gentlemen, the referee is momentarily halting this contest because of the depth of the cut on Finn Balor's head. If the doctor rules that Balor cannot continue, Edge will be the winner. Everybody will boo, right? Because you don't know what's going to go on yet, but everybody's still going to boo because that's what's going to happen if this guy got to get carried out to the hospital. Edge will be declared the winner, and we'll have another fucked up match. But if not, if he can go on, then it gives the guy, or it gives the people a pop when the guy says, I can continue. So, then get a long shot, get a wide shot from up in the stands. They're in a stadium. They could be so far back. You couldn't fucking see them with a telescope, but don't deliberately do close-ups and not shoot what the announcers are talking about. It was off putting the whole thing. And then once they got Balor closed up, then the uh, ring announcer can tell the people, ladies and gentlemen, Balor insists on continuing against doctor's orders. And the match will go on. Yay! And then they continue. But instead, they it was did did you see it as being that odd and people at home had to be going, what the fuck is this? Even though they knew what the fuck was going on, why are they shooting it that way? I mean, WWE did as good a job as they could to ignore it and pretend it wasn't there, but it was there. And, you know, Edge eventually, like I said, got pops for getting out other things that he could use in the match. There aren't a lot of wrestling people there with instincts who would jump in there and say what you just said. But that would have, it would have not only told the people at home Maybe something. if Snoop Dogg was at ringside, we'd have Maybe someone there. Maybe if Snoop Dogg, yeah. yeah. Me and Snoop Dogg think a lot alike from what I've heard. But it would have told the people at home and the people in the building, and it would have, when you think about it with what happened, that he was able to continue, and they did do at least much of the rest of what they had originally been going to do you could have actually booked that spot but it would have been a shoot that's fucking wrestling you can't really to what was that supposed to happen well it worked out okay and we're in the back going Whoosh. anyway finally the demon continues they went into false finishes at 100 miles an hour if Finn got a two count with a double stomp, tried to come off the ladder, but Edge stopped him and DDT'd him off the ladder for a two count. And I'm like, okay, now my, a DDT off the fucking ladder 
is a two count now after the guy's already had his head closed back up. You see, that's the thing. That's the only thing that did bother me just because eventually you couldn't completely ignore the fact that he clearly was really badly hurt on that ladder shot. They showed you the ladder shot several times. It was brutal. But then he shouldn't be selling things to his face anymore. <laughs> Well, it's the same point. Do you have to do all that shit to a guy that's already got his head stapled back together? And it just got ridiculous. Between And again, then they did another deal where Finn went for the stomp off the cage through a table, but Edge moves and he stomps through the table and Edge spears him and gets a two count. Jesus Christ. Because they had to finish the story by Edge giving him the concerto. And now, and then his head really should have been caved in. They they got given a gift in that they had a bad incident turn into a positive and that they could continue. Did they still have to, after the, again, after the guy's already bled buckets and maybe he's a little bit weaker now. Maybe that's his out. Maybe that's the demon's excuse for winning or for losing is that, you know, he was injured early on in the contest. So it didn't take a goddamn Paul Bunyan swing with a metal chair while the guy's head is laying on another chair to beat him. They they called one audible, they could have called another one. I don't know. Ah, but this was, again, you know, the Hell in a Cell doesn't need kendo sticks and chairs and tables and fucking Zabada because then it's just, it's chaos and it's a mess and it's a stunt show. Instead of the 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 best story that they told in retrospect in the match was the one that they didn't plan. Go ahead. Not much I can add to it. I've not been a fan of Edge on this run. And I'm not a big fan of just nonstop weapons. I mean, it's hell in a cell and they went right to the weapons. I did get into it a bit after Finn Balor got hurt. There's something about a guy legitimately getting hurt. Yeah. And wondering what's going to happen next. And then they just ran through all the spots they were going to do anyway. <laughs> you know, all right for what it was, but I just haven't really dug the edge stuff. The Judgment Day to me is all about Rhea and Dom and Priest. I have not liked the Balor Edge feud. And I, I, I liked Edge when he came back, and I like a lot of what Edge does, but this hasn't. And, and again, he's. Still, in his matches, he's doing a lot of weapons. A lot of weapons. And you would have thought maybe he might have figured out about them ladders. But nevertheless. Should we get to the main event of the evening? The main event? <laughs> For the undisputed Universal Champion! What is that way of announcing? It's because everybody thinks that they're Michael Buffer now. And I don't know. And, and some of them, they're imitating Smiley Roberts over on the other channel when he herniates himself, whenever Moxley comes out. Well, this was the big match, the one everyone was waiting for. Roman Reigns, the Universal Champion versus Cody Rhodes. Well, I would have liked to wait it a little longer after I saw what I saw. Um, Cody's entrance in the Sergeant Pepper outfit with his mom and the whole family in the front row, that was good. Uh, were there six grand pianos for Roman Reigns' entrance? <laughs> well, there were six pianos. I think one guy had a Casio stuffed in there, so I don't know what they were really playing, but... I'm not sure. It may have been, uh, you know, uh, Kay Kaiser and his College of Musical Knowledge, but nevertheless... Get Shane out of the way! We need to get the pianos <laughs> down the hall! <laughs> hey, real quick, I thought it was really cool that Cody Rhodes had Brody Lee Jr., negative one in AEW there at ringside. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it meant a lot to him. Yes. Really cool. And, and gave, and did he, he gave him the, the belt, right? The weight belt. Right. But then solo stole it. That dastardly yeah. solo Sokoa. No good son of a gun. But yeah, now that's the way to use Brody Lee's son and make him feel good and make him part of things and not, you know, the way that AEW... But again, another company does AEW shit better than AEW does. Um, From the time Roman Reigns said, acknowledge me, and the people blew, they were into this. It's what they came to see. And the match, I thought, 
was as close to as perfect as if, until the finish was as close to as perfectly what they should have done as possible. And again, you know, they start with wrestling and they did exactly what they should do a back and forth, but not trading moves with each other. It was momentum changes where it made sense that one guy would take over and then something would happen. And the other guy would get blah, blah, blah. And then again, they're, they're not going to take all the giant bumps in the first part of the match, but the, the Cody especially has been mixing his matches up where he'll give them some wrestling. He'll give them a cute spot that pays off and gets a pop. They'll go out on the floor and they'll rattle some things around and a couple of body slams on the floor. But Cody at the same time, at least pays lip service to rolling in and breaking the count to the referee so that he doesn't bury it completely, even though it's very loose a little bit of everything to keep it moving. And they obviously clearly set up who was heel and who was baby face solo and Heyman are there and solo interfered hit Cody in the ribs with a chair. And then Cody would fire up a second later and solo tripped him. And uh, then they did the, one of the big bumps, the big spots where they went out to the announce desks and Roman tried the pile driver and Cody backdropped him through the desk, and that looked like a million dollars. But then <laughs> Cody rolls Roman in, and Roman was running again. Even he, even here, even them. But Cody makes big comeback. People are up. He hits the first Cody cutter. He gets a two count. And then he hits his dive and throws him in. And that's where Solo stole the belt and whipped it with or whipped Cody with it. And Good old referee Rudy Charles from TNA, my old friend, heard it and kicked Solo out of ringside. And now they start the big false finishes, and they had some great ones. Uh, Cody super kick and crossroads two count. Roman rock bottom two count. Cody pedigree two count. Roman Superman punch two count. And now you're seeing Roman Reigns' facials. He's got doubt. He's got despair. He's got, dare I say, even panic, right? The facials were great on Roman because he was into another zone of showing vulnerability, right? Yes, I'm agreeing with you. Yes. So then again, you know, some more uh, false finishes. When Cody got the figure four, the announcer uh, Cole and Corey Graves popped like it was Dusty's hold. How many matches did his old man win with that? Almost none. How many championships? He actually championships. said, how many championships yeah. has he yeah. won with that hold? Not one I could think of. The only time when he wrestled Flair and would reverse it. That's when he'd get the figure four. Dusty Rhodes won more matches with a flying cross body than he did the figure four leg lock. And that wasn't really a flying. It was just a cross body. <laughs> it's more like a cross body drop. Anyway... So then there was a, a, a Roman reversed the figure four. Cody got the ropes. Roman hit a spear and got a two count. And then he front face locked Cody, but Cody fought out of it. And Cody got the ground pound, went for the kick. And Roman moved and they wiped the referee out. And then Roman hit the punch, but then Cody hit a clothesline and they both sold. And Cody was going to go for the crossroads when here come the Usos with the super kicks and a 1D on Cody. And they drag Roman into the cover. But then here comes Sammy and Owens hit. And they fight the Usos, you know, uh, um, to the point where the Usos bail. And then I was like, Owens gave Roman a stunner and Sammy hit the kick on Roman. And I didn't know, because I still thought they were going to do the right thing. And I thought, oh, I don't know how I felt about that. And because to me, when baby faces run out to stop interference in a title match or for a top to help a top baby face, they can't do any damage for him. They only have to level the playing field. They have to take out the people that are interfering. They have to neutralize the outside menace. But when they do damage to the 
babyface's actual opponent, then that becomes this guy not doing it on his own, but he had people helping him. Now, we didn't have to cross that bridge by the time we got to it, but that's what I was concerned about there. But then the Usos came back in and fought Sammy and Kevin off. So Cody, at, at that point, crawled back in and covered Roman, and the referee got back in and gave the slow count like this is going to be it. Two count, kick out. And I'm, ah, now I wrote going too far, question mark. Because if that's not it, what can be, right? And they fought on their knees and they went back and forth. And then Cody hit the jabs and the flip flop and fly and the bionic elbow. And people are up again and a crossroads and a second crossroads. And as he's pulled him up and he's going to go for another one, Heyman jumps up on the apron and draws the referee. And Cody's standing there for longer than he should have been. And then in comes Solo in a hoodie in disguise and hits him in the throat with the spike. And Roman hits the ropes after he's been flip-flopped and flied and bionic elbowed and crossroads twice. Roman jumps up, hits the ropes, and spears him. One, two, three. Cody is defeated. And it went, <sighs> What do you think, Brian? I was really getting into it by the end of it. And when Solo hit that spike before the pin actually happened, I said, oh, no. And then Roman won. Like everyone, disappointed, had expectations going into this. We talked about the Lex Luger comparisons. It wasn't even that. I feel bad for Cody. WWE, you know, Paul Levesque during the press conference after the fact said, we have our story. We're still telling it. This is still the beginning of the bloodline story. So they don't see Cody winning it as, you know, they see Cody winning it maybe the same way they saw Sammy winning it. This is just another step to whatever the bigger story is. It better not be. Dwayne Johnson coming back to end the bloodline. It has to be someone being made because of this. And Cody was in that spot. I mean, the big question I have coming out of this, I me mean, Roman in the bloodline, the storyline will continue starting tonight on Raw. But for Cody, even if he wins the title now at some point, it doesn't mean as much as it would have. So See, that's... Well, go, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. Well, that's the thing. That's exactly the thing. It probably won't mean as much. Now, again, they can have some, and they better, but they can be convinced that they have some twists and turns, some development, whatever's going to happen from here, that it'll be, wait till you see it, and it'll all play out, and it'll be even better than, you know, you thought it was going to be. That's, I'm sure, what's in the mind of, creative in the office and i'm sure there's a lot of people who trust them and like them are going to be saying well of course we're, we, they weren't going to do it then and you got to see how, what's going to happen and how everything's going to play out the the problem is this is a story and at some point every story even at new chapters you can't just have an endless book every story has to come to an end and then you either write a new story with new characters or you use the same characters and you write a sequel. But every story has to have some nominal end and this was the perfect place for this one. If the, if the peck tear hadn't happened and the when Cody first came in, th they were probably pointing toward this year's WrestleMania anyway. I don't know what they would have done to keep him busy if he hadn't been out for nine months. But when the peck tear happened and the packages have been so good, the promos have been so good, people have gotten into the story. People are always into the fucking story until they're not into the story anymore. And the balancing act that you walk is trying to, it's same thing, telling a joke or fucking, the, the punchline has to come with the timing, comic timing, athletic timing, everything's timing. 
when the time is right, as Abdullah the Butcher used to say. And I, I'm sorry, but I just wonder if this is maybe an even bigger budget equivalent of the Sheik throwing the fireball at Andre in Toronto. Well, now is there, it, it, do people just say, well, fuck, okay, that's it. There is no hope now. So we'll go about our business. For the people who don't know what I just referenced, the Sheik for seven years in Toronto was undefeated. And they ran Toronto 25 times a year in those days. Every show that he was on, he was in the main event. He was on almost all the shows. And every show that he was on drew more than 10,000 people. So he was selling north of a quarter of a million tickets a year in Toronto alone for seven years. Never lost. They finally, they bring in Andre the Giant. Andre versus the Sheik. People, now it's, this has got to be it. Andre fucking comes in the ring. Sheik comes in the ring. They go two minutes. Sheik throws a fireball in Andre's face. Andre rolls out, gets counted out. And Sheik never drew 10,000 people in Toronto again, did he, after that? I don't think so. So, <laughs> there's a time where every good story peaks, where every... We talked about it on the previous show where sometimes you have to give the people what they expect because it's the logical thing. And when you sometimes extend these things past their natural life, it, it doesn't have the same effect when you finally do whatever you were going to do. So I'd, I don't have a good feeling that that they did the right thing because of the anticipation and the expectation and the genuine, you know, wanting this more than people mostly, usually, lately, recently, have wanted anything to happen in that whole company. And they may have put it off into the point where it ain't going to pop like it would have. And now the story also is beyond the bloodline stuff tonight, Cody, because he didn't just lose. He was laying there in the ring while they celebrated. And then as they left, he was just in the ring sitting there by himself. You know, there wasn't a big, all right, let's hear it for Cody moment or anything <laughs> at the end. He was just sitting there seeing all this happen. So it's going to be the creative is going to be a big part of this. What are they going to do with Cody from here? Who are, who are they going to make in the next year that will have a better story more momentum more attractive culminate in such a, a place in such a way with such a match that they can make that person by beating roman reigns if not now and this guy then when and who 